Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Bill Freeman uh, to give our talk this morning. Uh, Bill is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at the Massachusetts of Institute of Technology, where he's been a professor or a faculty there since 2001. Uh, before that, he was a uh, research scientist at Mitsubishi Electric Labs just across the street. Um, he obtained his PhD uh, from MIT in 1992, and before that he also worked at Polaroid, so he's alternated between industry and academia. Um, Bill is uh, extremely well known in the fields of computer vision, computer graphics, having done a lot of very seminal work. And today he's going to be giving us a little tour through time and photography. Great. Um, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, this is a really fun talk to make and I'm glad to share it with you. Um, so I'm interested in photography and how photography tells stories over different time scales. And so I thought it would be illuminating to just organize it all and, and just go through from the sh practically the shortest possible photograph you could take to practically the longest possible one and talk about how photography tells stories over these different time scales. So uh, let's start off with the shortest possible photo you could take. Um, and that would be a picture of light itself. Uh, so this is um, a photograph of a, a very short pulse of laser light. You can see it here. And it uh, comes through a diffraction grating and uh, splits into the, well, the primary uh, lobe and then the first diffraction, uh, and then the second uh, order lobes. Um, and so how do you take a picture of light? Well, uh, this was done about. Um, about 10 years ago, using holography. So you uh, have your pulse that you're going to photograph going wherever you want to uh, have it go through, in this case on ground glass. And then there's a second reference beam, which exposes a photographic plate and makes a hologram at the same time. And this, they're both very short pulses. Uh, the photographic film only um, records the, the coherent beats of the two waves when this one passes over the holographic plate. And so this acts as a sort of gate for the photograph. And, um, and then if you take the developed hologram and look at it and move your uh, viewpoint across space, you get a picture over time of this light wave progressing. And that's quite remarkable. Um, recently, uh, there's been another remarkable thing of actually recording photographs of light uh, using electronic means, not just, not just uh, holography. And I wasn't going to talk about this because it's kind of unpublished work and so forth. But then people point out to me, look, it's on YouTube. So I'll, I'll tell you about this. It's not my work. It's uh, by Ramesh Raskar at the Media Lab. And um, let's see. So what do they do? They have um, an extremely short laser pulse. And then they have a special uh, sensor, which is uh, just a, a 1D sensor that uh, I guess you scan electron beam very quickly. And it's, it's only sensitive to light when the beam scans it so you can get the temporal resolution on the order of 10 to minus 12 seconds. Uh, but you can only record one uh, horizontal row at a time. So the photographs I'm going to take you, show you, which are of light traveling, actually took hours to expose because they had to just do the laser pulse over and over again. And they recorded one row, then the next row, then the next row, and so forth. But let me just show you these. Uh, so again, these are by Ramesh Raskar's group. So here is a light beam um, passing through yeah, maybe for this one we should. Someone just turn all off for a second. It's going to go through uh, a couple times. And uh, I, don't know if you can, I don't know if you can see him, but there, there's Ramesh down there describing his work at the International Conference on Computational Photography. So, um, and again, you, they, uh, they can record this by um, measuring with very fine temporal precision. Uh, one row at a time. Now, this next one they're going to show, overlay that, what we just saw, on top of a static photograph of the scene that was there. So now you can sort of see it all in context. 
and this light beam comes through the Coke bottle. They could have picked a better uh, subject, but anyway, and you can see it progress. So this is just, you know, this just blows my mind, actually. Um, and you can go to that web page and look at the videos yourself. So that's uh, in the very, very fast range um, on the order of... Uh, I think that was the darkest video, so we'll bring the lights back up. Yes, please. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, on the order of 10 to minus 12 seconds. Now let's slow it down <laughs> <laughs> by a factor of uh, 1,000 and get like 10 to the minus 9 seconds. What sort of photographs can you make there? Or is it useful to make there? Well, um, this is a realm that's useful for uh, time of flight depth imaging. Um, so there's a... Uh, camera which I bought in my lab about eight years ago, made by 3DV, they call it 3DV Systems. I, I think Microsoft might own it now, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, they uh, send a slab of light about 50 centimeters long out to the subject, then this bounces back. Uh, so 50 centimeters is on the order of 10 minus 9 uh, seconds worth of light. It bounces back and now the, um, the things that hit uh, an object which is close to you are ahead of the things which hit objects which are further away, so you've distorted this waveform. Then at the camera end, they go and quench the detection with a very fast shutter. So they, uh, so they, um, the, the camera only receives this amount of light. So now you've traded off depth coding for intensity coding. Now the intensity position is proportional to the depth away from you and you can make a depth image this way. So, um, Proportional modulate by some albedo. Right? Yes, so they actually have to take a, um, they have used two exposures to, to get this, right. And um, so here's an, uh, the RGB version and here's the depth camera version. It wasn't, it, it was pretty noisy, but it's serviceable as a depth camera. Um, okay, so that's the very, very fast. Now we're gonna slow it down again by another factor of a thousand roughly to the uh, one to two microseconds range of time. And this is the range of high-speed flash photography and ordinary flash photography. Um, so, uh, of course, the way you take a picture this way is by keeping the um, aperture open, having a dark room, and then for just this brief moment, expose the subject with a uh, flash of that duration, and you can capture events that happen over that sort of time scale. So how do you make a flash that short? Well, there's two ways. You can do it uh, chemically. So these are um, these people got the Nobel Prize for these very fast chemical reactions that they studied. Um, you can also make it electronically. And um, so Harold Doc Edgerton, uh, this well-known MIT professor, uh, pioneered these electronic flashes. And in preparing this talk, I, I discovered this wonderful web page, which has all his lab notebooks online. Um, and so, so here's a page of his lab notebook, you know, showing a design for this uh, very fast strobe. Uh, 1930, Harold Edgerton strobos stroboscope tests. Um, so anyway, he was a master at just taking beautiful photographs with these high-speed strobes. So here's a, you know, water as it cascades down. Here's a, a little assortment of photos. Bullet going through an apple. Um, you know, many photos over time of, of a diver. Um, Schlieren photography of a bullet going through a candle, uh, a bullet going through a card. Uh, this tells you when these photos were taken. This is a footballer of the day kicking a football. Um, this, is, this is one I, I really like. It actually tells a story over a number of different time scales. So here's a bullet, and here are three different balloons that the bullet has passed through. So this shot took about um, one, one to 10 microseconds. The exposure time is about one to 10 microseconds. But at the same time, we get a picture on the order of uh, the two milliseconds that it took the, billet, the bullet to travel this length of time by having the identical structure repeated. And, and now we sort of code uh, time over space and we see the, the, um, the progression of the destruction of the balloon as a function of time now displayed over space. Um, and of course, we, now high-speed flashes are commonplace and anyone can do them. So there's, you know, flicker groups on flash photography. So we need to get the updated version of the bullet going through the Yoplait yogurt. Um, there's the bullet there. Uh, and, and, but these are just, I don't know, I find them so delightful because they relate to everyday experience, but they let you see it in an entirely new way. So here's someone putting their finger in water, you know, and, and you see it in a way that you've never seen it before. 
um, here's, everyone likes bullets going through things. Here's a bullet going through a cookie, which looks like a cookie sneezing. Yeah. I was kind of wondering like how, how the society at large kind of related to that work. They sort of I think they embraced it. I mean, I think it was like a, at least at MIT, they tell us that he was like this hero, you know, this really well-known Right, right, that's guy. the dogma, but I, was, I don't know if the truth is true. But... Yeah, well, he, um, you know, he was, uh, took part in the war effort, too. He made these, um, there's a photograph of, of um, like, Cambridge from, from, from up in the air at night. He just had a humongo flash <laughs> that lit up the entire city at night, and they used these things for in World War II, you know, for reconnaissance. Um, okay, so that's flash. Now let's, let's slow it down again. Now, now finally we're in the realm of sort of conventional photography, say one five thousandth of a second to um, one twenty-fifth of a second ballpark. And of course, you know, there's billions of photographs one could show that were taken over this time range. It's sort of interesting to look at the very first photographs that were taken or movies that were taken over this, these sort of time scales. So, of course, um, then we have the names Murray and Moybridge and also Edison, uh, who in the late 1800s made motion pictures and, and photographs um, in these kind of time frames. So here's a uh, photographic rifle that Murray made. Uh, it shoots things at 12 frames per second. He's a fascinating person. He was a, trained as a doctor, and he was really interested in uh, circulation and in how things move and studying hummingbirds, and he sort of came to photography as a way to study his passion of how birds fly, how animals move. Um, so he took a lot of photographs of birds in flight, um, and they, they recorded these 12 frames around the circle of this photographic film. So here's one of his shots. And then he, he made these beautiful sculptures of, um, you know, a bird, I guess, I don't know if it's taking off or landing, but um, a bird in flight, and, and, and also these, this photograph of a, uh, a pelican uh, landing, which again you know, reveals a whole new viewpoint on, a, on an everyday thing. Um, he made bronze and plaster sculptures, sculptures of these. So here's some others of his, of uh, people hammering, jumping. And of course, Moybridge was a contemporary, and they... Um, they talk with each other. Uh, so Moybridge addressed the, the question of the day, which was when a horse gallops, is there ever a moment when all the hooves are off the ground at the same time? And this wasn't known before these photographs were taken. And uh, now you can see that there is a moment when all the hooves are in the air. Um, So now let's slow it down yet again uh, to the telling stories over the time scale of 1 25th of a second down to one second. So this is sort of the realm of photographic blur. And again, blur tells a story. Um, here's photos of blurry photos that, that tell you a story of what's going on over the, that sort of a time scale. Um, and there's also a web page I want to point you to, Ernst Haas photographs, uh, a whole series of blurred photographs, which are just gorgeous, just really artistically done. Um, here's a bullfighter. Here's a bird in flight. And then um, I was pointed, and on, on a blog, I was pointed to this web page by this uh, anonymous Flickr photographer called Just Big Feet, uh, who made these delightful photos of a marathon, again, taking exposures on the order of a second long. But you get these beautiful stories of, of runners. Um, and then, uh, so uh, this talk is almost all not my work, but there are little insertions here, kind of like product placements in a movie um, the, uh, of my work. You know, like in a movie when you see a product placement, you wonder, well, God, why are they focusing on that Coke can so much? And anyway, so here's the first product placement. Um, this is uh, joint work with um, Ayan Chakrabarti. Uh, graduate student at Harvard and Todd Zickler. You can use blur to help you learn about the image. Um, you can use it to help segment out the blurred from the non-blurred objects if you have a uh, carefully designed 
prior model for how images ought to look and how blurred images ought to look. You can, uh, uh, you can make a one-dimensional search for all the over all possible motions and find the most probable uh, speed of any one region and, and segment out the individual region according to how it was blurred. So here's a, a segmentation of the blurred runner. Um, and why, why do the shoes blur less than the foot they're attached to? Uh, why do they? Yeah. Well, because they're on the ground. No, there's one shoe off the ground. Oh, oh this one, I see. Yeah. Um, well, that could be a number of things. There's actually... Um, there are a lot of steps in the segmentation algorithm, and it could well be because the contrast between the shoe and the grass is not as strong as the contrast between the skin and the grass. Or it could be that they're measuring horizontal motion. Oh, yes, we were, actually. Going up. Yes, <laughs> thank you. But even then, the calf and the foot and the shoe go together. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. They do go together. Um, I'm not sure. That if there's, as I said, this is actually the, the local blur is just one input to this segmentation algorithm, and there are other inputs as well. Um, so, so now let's go down, uh, slow it down even more, down to the time frame of seconds to hours. So this, of course, is the world we all live in. This is the world that movies are in. Um, and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of wonderful ways to tell stories over these timescales, too. Um, typically, you often have you know, time one and then time two, maybe several hours later or, or uh, minutes or seconds later. later. And, okay, so there are a number of ways you can describe what's going on over this time. You might assume that what's going on between these two time frames is a stationary process, and, and you just want to describe what's, what's this constant process that's happening between these two times. So it might make sense to average uh, images over these times, and I'll show you some of those. You can also, again, assume it's a constant process, but select different ones that stand out in some way. And so there's... Uh, useful work to do with, with uh, what you would call image selection. And then finally, you might assume that there's a process that's actually somewhat changing over this time, and you might study, analyze how things have changed over that time. So, so let's go through these one at a time. First, let's uh, kind of describe what's going on between these two times separated by seconds or hours through averaging. And now we get to uh, another artist, uh, Jason Salavan, who has made these wonderful uh, pictures that are... Um, Averages of the, uh, well, averages of many things, but these are averages of the late night sh talk show hosts. Um, so here's, <laughs> here's an average of many images of Jay Leno. Uh, can you tell who this one is? It's Conan O'Brien, Dave Letterman. And what's so delightful is they, you know, they tell a little story about what each, they're all different in a slightly different way, and you can recognize, I, I find I can recognize them. Um, here's another averaging. Uh, photo, uh, an eight-hour photograph by an artist, Ada Kim, um, which, again, tells a nice story about urban life, really. Um, so that's averaging. And then, as I mentioned, there's selection. So how are you going to select pictures, which frames to show of, of many frames that you might collect between these two time frames? Well, one way to do it is by which one is closest to you, or which pixel is close to you each time. So this brings up something called shape time photography, which is our second product placement, I should say. Um, so this is something uh, I was involved with. Um, so here's the deal. You take uh, stereo images of something many times a second, and so you record both depth and image information. Um, and you can use that to tell a story of things moving over time. So for example, suppose you have uh, five frames from a video of, of the, you know, the, the death rattle of a, a quarter on a table, how might you composite those together to describe the action of the coin rattling on a table? Well, you can just average them all together with the averaging method. And that kind of works. It tells you, let's just see what happened. But there are a number of problems with it. You can't get any sense of the depth of things or the, or the temporal order, ordering of things. And also, you have reduced contrast in the regions where things are averaged together. Um, oftentimes, computer vision methods are used to uh, extract out the foreground thing from the table. And then you can layer by time. You can put the first things in first, and then layer on top of that the thing that happened next, and so forth. And so that fixes the contrast problem. 
But now you've got another problem. The shapes are all wrong. You know, the thing that's on the bottom is actually on the top in this photograph, and so it doesn't, doesn't really tell you the story of how the shapes relate to each other. So instead, you can make your selection of which pixel to show from each time according to their shape. So you show the, um, at every pixel, you show the, the intensity corresponding to the thing that was closest to you out of all of them. And so this gives you uh, sort of an approximation to what you would have seen if you were looked at the union of all those shapes at the same time. And we call this shape time photography. And you can use it to tell little stories of you know, short-term things. So here's three um, photos of my wife sewing something. And then here's a little composite picture telling you, you know, how to sew. And uh, here are two pictures of my brother-in-law's head. And I'm sure you're all wondering, well, what would his head look like if it were at the same place at the same time? Uh, it would look like that. <laughs> um, OK. So and this relates to, more generally, what you might call another selection method you could call, called lucky imaging. So here the story is that there's this process going on over this time. But um, maybe there's something obscuring it at some moments and not at others. Or maybe what you're really are looking for occurs at some moments but not at other moments. So you want to select out those lucky shots. And this, this is used in astronomy uh, with great success. So um, here's a single exposure of a distant astronomical object. Uh, obviously under very noisy conditions. And here's another exposure. When the atmospheric turbulence was a little bit better, so you could see the object a little bit better then. And it's, it's enough better that you could actually measure out of all your photos that this one's a good one and that one's not a good one. You, you could imagine perhaps looking at the local variance or something. So if you take an average of 50,000 of these, you get this. And if you take an average of just 500 of these selected good ones, then you get this. And so uh, this is called lucky imaging. And, and you um, are just grabbing those moments when the turbulence happens to line up just right to give you a better view of things and either show those or, or average over those to get your lucky picture. It's turbulence because the noise you'd expect to be fairly. Yeah, I think that's the right way to put it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Microsoft researchers have exploited this. So uh, uh, Michael in the back should really be telling the story, but I'll just say it anyway. So this is uh, work he and Neil did in Rick's group um, looking at Mount Rainier. So first of all, I, I'm told just getting a picture of it at all, I guess, is a one lucky thing right there. But on top of that, <laughs> um, uh, let's see. So let's see. Here's an input, hazy. Uh, you can apply image processing techniques to it and get this dehazed version. So this is pretty good. Sorry? Actually, very clear day. This, this one was. It isn't clear day. Okay, great. Clear day, right. Clear day. Image processing makes it look even clearer, but you were not quite there yet. It's still rather noisy. So uh, let's take an average over many photographs of, of these dehazed images, and we get this. But again, we're we're subject to the atmospheric turbulence that slightly disturbs the light paths over that long distance. And so instead, what they did was a local, um, a local shifting of each patch to, to, to get them over the ones that they're averaging over to line up much better by, uh, by making local adjustments rather than a single global adjustment. And um, so by doing that, that sort of local lucky imaging and, and adjustment, they can make a, a photograph like this of, of the Mount Rainier. Any other, anything I, did I miss my lines? One more <laughs> yeah. after this. This is without the lucky, that's actually just the align. There's one more that, that's aligned to all of them. Anyway, I'll, I'll okay. show you the result after. Okay, thank you. Is that one more slide or? Okay, okay, good, I'll get it right. This is very helpful to have the author there. <laughs> um, here's another one, uh, again with, same author. Um, this is, again, a form of lucky imaging, although a different kind of context. Um, and uh, so again, this is Michael's work. Um, you have a group shot. And again, this is sort of a, if you will, a continuous process over a lot of time where people randomly smile. But they don't all randomly smile together. So you can't all get that one shot that you want. And 
you want to uh, combine the different locations at different times to give you a single composite shot where everyone's smiling, everyone looks good. This was back in the days when Michael was still in the witness protection program, so we don't see his face here. But uh, this was, I guess, to protect anonymity of an, uh, a uh, submission. So that's another form of lucky imaging. And then um, one thing that I wanted to do, which was a form of lucky imaging, was I always wanted to go to a large plaza and get a movie of, of just the countless people walking along and then construct a single composite image where everybody was walking on their left foot, you know, as if they're all marching together. Um, well, it turns out an artist has done this, and of course, I'm sure done it much better than I could have. Um, there's an artist named Peter Funch who's got wonderful photos with just that idea in mind. So here's one uh, where everybody's in the air. <laughs> Except this one guy here who's like wondering what's going on. <laughs> and again, I, so he doesn't say how he made this photo, but I assume that it was a form of lucky imaging that you, you stood there with a tripod and photographed many, many people that came across. And, and whenever anybody was in the air or running to get somewhere, photographed them when they were in the air and then composited all the appropriate photos together to get this single collage, although it doesn't look like a collage because I'm sure it was all taken from the same place. Um, and he has just a whole series of these. Uh, so here's another one. Everybody carrying a manila envelope. <laughs> um, and um, this one's really nice. This is uh, everybody in Times Square taking a picture. And, and um, can you tell what the story is here? Yeah, a world of children. Uh, everyone's, everyone's young. <laughs> um, so those are, again, uh, lucky imaging, but done by an artist. Um, there's another artist whose work I really like. And she makes found animations. So here's a photo of a horse. And she went and collected lots of photos of horses and made a movie out of it. Um, so again, this is, you could think of this as lucky imaging. The time scale is actually longer than just a few hours. I'm sure these photos were taken over many different months, but um, they're all composited to make a single story. And then um, she has another one. If you, if you'll, so this, this next one she did, it really doesn't fit in with the story about pictures over time, but it fits in with the um, story of random selection, and I like it so much I'm just going to insert it into the talk here, okay? So we're going to take a two-slide break from the talk about time and show you two other images by Cassandra C. Jones. So there's one. Um, I just love it. You know, it's random selection. Here's lightning forming a little bunny rabbit. <laughs> and here's lightning forming a little squirrel, chipmunk. <laughs> Anyway, I just, these are, again, uh, random selection. They're not telling a story about time, but they're telling a story about. Is your process automated? No, I, I'm sure it's not, actually. I mean, yeah, I don't think so. Um, OK. Sorry? That would take a lot of patience to just be moving the shapes around and make something. Yeah, yeah, True. yeah. Um, and then you can also uh, show how things have changed. So now we're on to how, describing changes over time. Uh, again, showing things by one of my favorite scientists, uh, <laughs> Michael, um, and collaborators. So this is uh, selecting images from, from a short sequence and compositing them together to, again, tell a story of changes over time. His daughter on the swing set, or monkey bars. Um, this is another one which, again, just like the balloons by Edgerton, makes a story of uh, time separated by spatial position. So here's uh, a sequence of um, photos of a building being blown up. And here they've composited them together with the latest ones on the left and the earlier ones on the right. So you now code time spatially, and you get to see in one, one photo of the whole spatial structure how it deforms over time. And then just to show off, then they went and did it the other direction, too. So here's the, now it's, now it's times later on the right and earlier on the left. Um, um, 
And in case there are a few of you in the room who haven't seen this, I'd like to show you this thing that we've done, um, we call motion magnification, which analyzes small motions and exaggerates them so you can see them. So here's uh, my wife on the swing set behind her house. Uh, we track feature points carefully to avoid occlusion artifacts. Then we cluster them uh, according to similar tracks over time. Then we group them in a, um, uh, it, it, to get a layered motion representation of the motion. Now the user says, okay, take the red stuff and amplify its motion by a factor of 40. So we're going to make a motion microscope. We're going to let you see small motions. And you put the pixels back in and push them around that way. But now we've got holes where we didn't see data before. So we use texture synthesis methods to fill in the missing holes. And now we have a little motion microscope that lets us um, see the small motions as they would have appeared if they were amplified by some factor. She looks at this and asks if I felt the video made, makes her look heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and here's the motions that someone undergoes to balance upside down. There's some uh, push down these wooden things on the aluminum supports, and it actually moves. Um, oftentimes, parents of perfectly healthy newborns wonder, is the baby breathing? So now we can, you know, now we can tell them. Um, and you can actually use it for science. So here's. Um, very small deformations of a membrane uh, as an acoustic wave goes across it uh, in, in the ear of some animal. Um, so that magnified, you can see the deformation, but the original, you really can't see the form of the deformation at all. So uh, this was uh, published in a paper on that, on that membrane. And so that's sort of taking, taking something and exaggerating its difference relative to zero motion. Uh, recently, we've gone and gone a little further with that, and tried to exaggerate the difference of one motion from another motion. So here this uh, is a two, uh, the same car going over the same speed bump, once with its trunk empty and once with its trunk full. Um, you might imagine this was sponsored by the Defense Department sponsor, uh, but here it is again. And so we track each one carefully, and now we're going to exaggerate not the motion relative to zero, but the motion of the full trunk car relative to the empty trunk car to see if we can see a difference in how it moves. And indeed, you can. And you can sort of see an exaggerated version of those uh, differences in the motion. OK, so now we're going to slow it down even further, down to hours to months. So this is in the realm of time lapse photography. So let me start with a nice time lapse. Uh, this is from uh, Planet Earth, the um, BBC documentary. And this is a beautiful time lapse. Uh, and great care was taken to make that, I assume, because it's really hard to uh, get it to be so smooth. And of course, there's camera motion very slowly at the same time. So you've got these kind of two different temporal processes. It feels like a, just a conventional pan. But that, that panning took a long time to do, of course. One being several days. Well, over the, I mean, at the same time scale as these flowers took to open up. That may have been shot by this. I think there's a, unfortunately. So there's a, oh. yeah, I think it's sky. Right? Yeah, that's the, well, so there may have been a compositing yeah. going on there because um, there's, there is a uh, making of thing that's a part, it's a different sequence where they actually talk about the fact that, yeah, you have cloud cover and the sun comes in, it's impossible to do it, so the way that they do that is actually bring all the flowers into the studio. Great, this is very helpful. So, right, I'll, I'll look at that. Yeah, making it's actually it's well worth watching. All right, okay, thanks. It's not, the, it's not Planet Earth, it's actually the BBC Live, but it's the same people. Okay. They have this wonderful tracking shot going through a, um, like a glen or something like that. Okay. Okay, and it's just astounding, but it's all done inside. Great. Good. Well, that fits in with my point, actually, um, that um, there's really a lot of room for computational photography to make an impact here. Um, typically with time lapse, there are all these things happening over this long period of time. So you know, maybe the lighting's changing, maybe the, um, the object's moving around in a way you don't want. So you've really got to understand the, the sort of higher level. You, you want to have these controls over these things, which normally are difficult to control in a photograph, such as the uh, changing the lighting or changing the position exactly. And so if we have better computational understanding of those things, we can do a better job of 
uh, recording events over these long time scales. So a, a first attempt at this was made by um, researchers at Harvard and at Merle, or I guess they're now at Harvard, um, Hans-Peter Pfister, Wojtek, Tusik, Anderson Kiewicz, and Kalyan Simkowali. So they um, worked with time lapses and first developed a method to remove cast shadows from the time lapse. And then with the cast shadows removed, uh, you can identify them because the intensity goes way down. With the cast shadows removed, then they did a low rank factorization of the sequence to separate out uh, the sequence into different components, um, time of day and, and lighting components. So, so here they're re-rendering their sequence without shadows, and then they can also then um, manipulate their low rank decomposition further. So this is uh, kind of a first step at the sort of thing you want to do. Of course, it required a stationary camera and, and stationary subject for this case. Um, and, and a key piece of making good photographs over long time sequences, I believe, is tracking. And the better we can do tracking, then the, the more flexibility we have at, at rendering things sharply that, that are moving over time and so forth. So just as to address the point of what is the state of the art in computer vision of tracking, Here's what we think it is. So we took this sort of the best, or a good candidate for the best tracker, this uh, Brox and Malik tracker, and re-implemented it by my extremely good graduate student, Michael Rubenstein. So this is kind of a picture of what the state of the art is in the published literature, as opposed to uh, what Brox and Malik's have in their code that they haven't released or whatever. And so here's, um, here it is. Uh, okay, so the, each track is coded with the color of when track was lost for that piece. And so you can tell uh, what the color code means by looking at the color of these things as they slide off the end. Let me play it again. So um, these last all the way until the red stuff slides off the end, uh, but others not quite as long. And, and you'd like, to, ideally, all the dots here would be the same red color throughout the whole tracking of the cheetah. Um, is, if, let me just, is that clear, the, uh, this color coding? Um, it's demonstrating that the, these tracks are actually much more short-term than you'd like them to be. You'd like them to be stuck on for the whole length of the time that the cheat is in view, and even remembering when they pass through occluders. Right, I don't believe there is an appearance model that changes over time for this one. And of course, that's what, you know, that's what we're working on. Um, um, so uh, just a, another piece of work that we've been involved with. Um, for, in a time lapse, there are things going on at all these different time scales. So here's some sprouts growing. And you've got this very short time scale of the, the sprout ends flickering back and forth. And you've got the longer time scale process of the the plants growing themselves. And you'd like to, I mean, I think you'd like to be able to make a photo that that's took those things and treated them separately. You'd like to be able to just see the long-term effect by itself, and that would maybe clarify this time lapse for you. So um, without actually tracking, we've made a what we call a motion denoiser that addresses that problem. So um, again, let me just go through this in a little bit more detail. The game is, we want to make a new video that's going to use the pixels only from this video and just reorganize them in space and in time. So we're not going to use a pixel that we've never seen before. We're just going to put it into a different position. So the desired output of our algorithm is a warp map, which tells us where we've, where we've grabbed each pixel from that we're rendering. So what do we want the warp map to look like? So that's W as a function of the position P. So we have several terms that tell us what a good warp map is. One is that it more or less respects the original video. So the intensity of the warped video minus the intensity of the non-warped is, is small. Uh, but that would just give us the original video back if we didn't do anything else. So we're going to also say that um, we want the warped map to change very little over time. The warped mapped video, the output video, to be pretty slowly changing over time. So the, uh, the output at one time should equal the output at another time. And then finally, we want this warp map, where we grab our pixels from, to be spatially and temporally smooth. So this, there's another term there. 
And these three terms define a, a Markov random field. Um, and you can find the optimal, the, find an approximation to the optimal warp map, which gives you the, uh, optimizes this objective function we've created. You can do it a number of different ways. Uh, iterated conditional modes is one solution method. Uh, graph cuts is another. And loopy belief propagation is another. We tried all three. And for this particular problem, loopy belief propagation worked best. And so here then is the, uh, our approximation to the optimal warp according to this uh, objective function we made. Here's the original video, and here's our motion denoised video output. So what we're trying to do is show only the long-term effects and not the short-term. And here's a little story that tells how this video was made. Here's the spatial displacement at every position, and here's a color code telling what, um, how the color displayed here corresponds to a spatial displacement from the center of this uh, figure. And here's a, a color map showing the temporal displacement of every pixel. So you take these pixels and you grab across space and across time according to this map and you get this output video. Let me just play it again. Um, and then the thing you might notice is it looks pretty good, but we've clipped off some of the ends. And that's because this whole thing, um, the state space that you're trying to solve for, the, the translated pixel position in space or time, where there are many different translations that we have to consider. And so that uh, that slows down the solving of this thing, and, and it, we, ha we had to only consider a relatively small volume in space and time. And if we just take a little crop of, of this video and allow ourselves a bigger uh, search space in space and time, then we get uh, output frames which look much closer to the desired ones. So, uh, so this is just a matter of computational time to, to fix that artifact. But So now you can take your input video and separate it into the short-term kind of low frequency motion components and the high frequency uh, long term and short term components. Yeah? Is it possible to get some sort of like a temporal moray effect? Hmm. Um, sure. That would, that would come in actually right at the time lapse itself. Um, and so that might mask a high frequency thing as something that's low frequency, and then we would look at it as low frequency and not smooth it out. That's true. Um, here's just a comparison of different ways you might do this motion denoising problem. Here's the source. Here's taking, just taking the, the average at each position, the average value um, over, the, over the sequence. Uh, over some temporal window, taking the median value over the temporal window, and here's our motion denoised output. So as you might expect, just taking the average over time gives you something that's kind of smooth, but it's blurry. The median's a little bit better, and the motion denoised is a little better. Here on the bottom, we show a um, space-time drawing of this, so you can kind of see better what's going on. Here's one scan line displayed over multiple times. So in the original, it just goes, wiggles back and forth. Uh, as we saw in the original video, um, the mean and median are blurred out somewhat, and here's the motion denoised. Just to show you a few more of these, um, this, and this will appear in CVPR in June. Here's a source, long-term components and short-term components. Um, here's a swimming pool being dug, and you can see in the output this um, grill uh, cover is, is stabilized. And you can, again, separate into the long-term and the short-term components of the video. Um, and this isn't perfect, but it's, it's taking steps in the direction that I think computational photography should go for long time scale events of, of giving you kind of independent controls over these diff different components of the video. Here we're looking at the kind of low frequency motions and the high frequency motions. You can also imagine, there's a beautiful set of time-lapse images made by the Extreme Ice Survey of glaciers. Uh, and here's the original time-lapse of the glacier, and, and it's really noisy in many ways. Um, but here we've applied our method to pull out just the long-term and the short-term components of it, and we, we think it gives a better rendering of it. So now let's go beyond time-lapse up to years and centuries. How do you tell stories with photography over the time of years and centuries? Well, one way to do it is to just photograph very, to, to, to look at photographs from very long ago. I mean, that tells a story over 
time. So I just want to show you these photos, which I like so much. Um, these are some of the earliest color photos made. They were um, separations made, uh, you know, um, sort of temporal multiplex the, the, to, obtain, to obtain the color. So make a black and white photo through three different colors of filters. And then if you combine them together, you can get a color photo. And we now, with um, digital methods, we can combine them to get much richer color pictures than they could have seen when they took them back then. And, and now we have some of the world's first color artifacts uh, <laughs> from the, the fact that the motion waves, of course, didn't stay stationary over the three different exposures. Um, another way to tell stories over, over years and centuries is to, to compare photographs that were taken a long time ago with photographs that you take now. And so there's a really nice set of, there's a book called New York Changing of what's called re-photographs of old photos. So a person um, went and, and retook photos from many different locations. So this original set were taken around 19, in the mid-1930s and the new set were taken around 2000. So it's very illuminating to compare the two. So here's the Manhattan Bridge looking up. And it changes very little over the course of time. Um, here's uh, looking from on the bridge 1935, and how do you think it's going to change in 2000? Well, wider. pardon? I was going to say wider. Comments. Well, okay, but actually, this is the pedestrian part of it, and you get, you get you know, constraints on what you can do, <laughs> fences. Uh, and um, here's an old photo of a street corner, 1936 and 2001. And, and this, uh, you know, just even something as simple as this would make a nice sort of master's thesis computational photography project. You'd like to have these two in, as inputs and get a separate picture of what was there in one picture but not in the other and there in the other but not in one and do it in a nice artifact-free way. Uh, it would be non-trivial and I think it'd be nicely useful. Um, another way you can apply computational techniques to these problems is to use the computer to help you with making these re-photographs. So uh, this is work uh, by my colleague, Fredo Durand, and uh, Asim Argawala, and his student, Somi Bey. They, they use computer vision methods to help you line up your camera at the right position to match a, a, an input photo that you want to make a re-photograph of. Uh, so this uses the, the kind of computer vision methods you might expect, um, local feature detectors and uh, knowledge of the geometry to, to tell you how to move the camera, how to adjust the focus. Um, so this is a test, where here's a reference photo and re-photographing using their method and re-photographing uh, kind of naively trying to make it match. How many Sorry. years ago did they do this work? Um, no more than four, maybe. Okay. Uh, the, the only reason I'm asking is that back then they might have had to do it with a laptop and a camera. Now it could be an iPhone app. Right? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, it was not, I know it was not just on the iPhone. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so here's some, you know, some real test cases. Here are, let's see, reference photographs. Okay, each row is the same place. Um, reference photo, reference, other reference photo, their re-photography results, and then a comparison against a professional photographer who has also re-photographed the same thing. And you can see they get it slightly better, although, uh, you know, it's a shame they had that car blocking the view there, but maybe that, that's part of the story too. Um, and then again, another way to tell stories over hundreds of years is not just to compare individual photos, but to compare an aggregate of the photos. So uh, here again is um, the artist Salavan, uh, this time showing a, an average of high school yearbook portraits from 1967 and from 1988. And, and again, this is just kind of delightful that you can sort of see a story in these average pictures and then see how the averages change over time. Um, one of my favorite and, you know, kind of forehead slapper, wish I had thought of that thing for telling stories over long periods of time is this Picasso um, uh, face movie application. So here's the YouTube video of it. It's really simple. Sorry. I think this is coming out as a paper this yeah. summer. Oh, really? Because yeah. it was on the video preview. They just did yeah. it yesterday. Okay. 
Um, let me just finish this and I'll get your question. Um, so you take all your pictures, put them in a shoebox, as it were. I guess you have to tell what the ordering is. And the, the only computer vision technology really is identifying the face and lining things up so that the transitions work well. But it's such a wonderful, compelling story over many years that tells the story of this, this woman growing up. Um, and anyway, this is such a, again, it's a nice use of computational methods to help tell stories over long periods of time. Yes? Two, two questions. One, there is a, a series of four sisters over, I think, 25 years. I think the Nixon sister, not sure. And an artist painted, uh, uh, photographed, and they will try to, uh, what you call it, canonicalize them so the same sister in the same position. Huh. If the something sisters, maybe Nixon, maybe not. Okay, I haven't seen that. And the other is, has anybody tried to re-photograph the original building that Nissi Ford Nips photographed in the 1820s? Which ones in the 1820s? In the 1820s, I believe the first photograph oh, of Nissi Ford Nips. Oh, oh. oh. It maybe it's still standing. Okay, no, I'm, I'm not aware. Um, and okay, now finally we're going to slow it down again. We're going to go beyond centuries. How can you take photos? beyond centuries. Well, um, there's kind of two ways you might look at it. One is let's try to take photos over centuries time scale of human scale things. You know, can we make a, instead of a time capsule, can we make us like a time capsule camera that just records things over hundreds or thousands of years? And this is a, becomes, you know, as much a hardware project as a computational project. Uh, it reminds me of the, the 10,000 year clock that was, um, I don't know if they're still working on that project or if they've launched it or what, but they, the goal was to make a clock that would keep accurate time for 10,000 years. Uh, and so if you want to make a camera like that, I think you'd have similar um, obstacles to work against. But then the second way to make very, very long, make photographs of very, very long ago is to give up on the notion of taking pictures of things at a human scale and go back to relying on the finite travel time of light and, and, and look at astronomical images. And so now we can, um, again, if we give up on taking pictures of ourselves, uh, we can take pictures of, this is from 5,000 years in the past because it's a, an astronomical object that's 5,000 light years away. Uh, so let me just run through a little bit of this. Uh, let me jump ahead here. This is 50 million years in the past. Um, this is 200 million years in the past. And this is 3.8 billion years in the past. There was actually an event that, that occurred over the course of several, uh, just a day or something. It was uh, some, they think some star slipped into some black hole and made this huge uh, gamma ray burst, which astronomers then directed their telescopes at and looked at. And so here's a picture of that area that, where this catastrophe occurred 3.8 billion years ago from our frame of reference. Um, how, how did they date? How long ago the light left this galaxy, or how far it is? Yeah, so there, um, I believe the number of ways, um, there are these sort of reference galaxies that, that, uh, that where they, they think they know how far away they're moving, how fast they're moving away from us, and so from the redshift you can tell how far away they are, and um, uh, I don't know all the details, but tricks like that are used. So, and you're not going to get a photograph much, of something much older than this, because that's, you know, less than an order of magnitude away from the age of the universe itself. Uh, so, that's, so that's the other extreme of, how, of kind of photograph you're going to take. So we've covered the gamut then from the very, very, you know, the shortest, taking a photograph of the fastest thing that can, anything can be moving and to a photograph of as long ago as we can see. And photography lets us take pictures everywhere in between, really. Um, as far as what, you know, where the research is to be pushed, I just don't think we're going to beat the, the, you know, the short time Edgerton, the, the beauty of these uh, photographs by Edgerton and, and other people as well. But I do think there's a lot to be done in the area of long time frame photography because, uh, again, these, these things that you want to uh, remove are, are lighting effects or changes in position, and, and now that's a computer vision problem, handling those properly. And I think, we can, I think there's a lot to be done in, in this realm of the problem. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Yeah. Uh,
Before we take questions, I just wanted to say one thing I forgot to say at the beginning, which is Bill is here for the whole week. Bill is a consulting researcher with us, so you can talk to him about anything you're doing in the company. No, you know, he's signed non-disclosure agreements. So please either drop by his office, which is in our hallway, or send him an email. He's got an internal email account, or he reads his MIT email. So please take advantage of his visit to, to chat with him. So are there any questions now? You've been good about asking questions during the talk. Yes. Can I ask you, it's a very fast because you use nonlinearity in the film because, you know, two, two, two beams of light give you way more than, than twice the black. I think otherwise I just don't see how it could be done. Yeah. Um, I've, I think that's the story. I mean, also, it's the, the fact that these two beams of light, it's not just a nonlinear action, nonlinear interaction. It's the fact that they're coherent with respect to each other. So um, that would give you a different signal than just averaging each one by itself. Um. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot. Sure. Yeah. And I have this book of edges.